We have shown in a previous lesson that the specific force is conserved across a hydraulic jump. The two water depths H1 and H2 in the equation here are the sequent depth, situated on either side of HC. H1 is below HC, while H2 is above HC. We will now see how to calculate this depth. Let us consider this trapezoidal channel. For these flow conditions indicated here, the critical depth is about 3 meter. If we consider a hydraulic jump with an upstream depth H1 equal to 2 meter, what will be the downstream depth H2? To find H2, we write the equality of the specific forces that is developed like this in equation 1. And as the unknown is the water depth H2, we will need to develop the area um, A2 here and the static moment as a function of the water depth. We already know the development for the area in the case of a trapezoidal cross-section that is recalled here in equation 2. For the static moment, we decom decompose the trapezoidal cross-section into two triangles and one rectangle like here, one triangle, the second one, and the rectangle, which results in equation 3. Combining equations 2 and 3 into equation 1, we obtain this equation 4 here, in which finally we see that the only unknown is H2. But as this appears in different terms, we will isolate again the highest power of H2, and we obtain equation 5 that will be solved by iterations. So, let us now apply this to our example. As H1 equal to 2 meter is below HC, we know that H2 will be larger than HC. So we start from an initial value, uh, an initial depth, for example, H2 equal 4 meter, that is above HC. The table indicates the iteration that progressively converge towards a depth of 4.467 meter. Note that for trapezoidal cross sections, the convergence might be slow, so be careful in your practical applications. In the case of rectangular cross sections, things simplify significantly. Equation 1 expressing the equality of the specific forces can be expressed as in equation 2 because we just have simplified the static moment and the area for the rectangular cross section. Dividing then the equation by um, L, uh, L divided by 2 and grouping the terms, we obtain equation 3. And then, dividing by H2 minus H1, we obtain equation 4. Using the definition of the critical depth, we can obtain this interesting intermediate result here, that highlights the distribution of H1 and H2, the two sequent depths, around HC. This form here will be useful later when calculating the head losses in a hydraulic jump. Multiplied by H2, equation 4 is simply a second order equation in H2 for which the positive root is expressed in equation 5 here. Remembering the definition of the food number and using it in equation 5, we obtain finally this equation for H2. So we see that in the case of a rectangular cross section, the sequent depth H2 can be calculated directly. Without, without any iterations. This very simple expression allows to calculate the sequent depth with an excellent accuracy, as shown by the comparison with experiments performed at the USBR. This demonstrates first the validity of the assumptions that we, that we made, but also the capacity of the Euler theorem that allows to capture such a complex phenomenon using only the concept of control volume. Now that we can calculate the sequent depth, that, that are the two depths upstream and downstream of a hydraulic jump, 
we will be able to determine the position of a hydraulic jump in a channel. Consider this mild, mild slope channel with an underflow gate he here as its upstream end and a downstream level as indicated here, that could for example be the level in a reservoir. As the water depth below the gate HV is smaller than HC, we know that we will have a M3 profile starting from the gate. Assume that in the present case, for example, this profile does not reach the downstream end of the channel. We could also start the calculations from the downstream level. As this level is above HC, we know that we will have a subcritical flow and as a water profile depending on the downstream condition. This is the M2 profile represented here. So there is obviously a conflict between the upstream and downstream situation. And we will have a hydraulic jump somewhere in this channel, allowing the flow to cross the critical depth. The hydraulic jump is described by the equality of the specific forces F1 and F2 on both sides of the jump. So if we consider that the M3 profile here represents all possible H1 depths and that the M2 profile represents all possible H2 depths, we have to find a position where H1 and H2 are such that F1 equals F2. To do this, if we consider that the M3 profile is the locus of all possible H1 depths, we can, for each point of the M3 profile, calculate the corresponding sequent depth H2. This yields the sequent profile M3 prime, illustrated here by the green dashed line. Actually, this sequent water profile is not really a water profile, but just the locus of all possible sequent depths. The M3 profile crosses the M2 profile at point Y. For this point, we know that we have the equality of the specific forces Fx equals Fy. So we could consider that Xy here, this vertical line, is the position of the hydraulic jump. However, if we remember that the hydraulic jump extends over a certain distance lambda, we can shift the M3 profile, uh, the M3 prime profile by this distance lambda, which results in the M3 second profile here in red. The new intersection is now at point Z. And the hydraulic jump can be represented like this by the XZ line. The final flow profile with the hydraulic jump is as illustrated here. A M3 profile until point X, then the hydraulic jump, then the M2 profile from point Z to the downstream end of the channel. However, in practice, as we have seen that the length of the hydraulic jump can in general be considered as negligible compared to the length of the channel, we will represent the hydraulic jump as a vertical jump from point X to point Y, which is this final pro flow profile illustrated here. Let us apply this to an example in this rectangular channel. The channel is 1000 meter long and has a bed slope of 0 0.5 per thousand. As the upstream end of the, at the upstream end of the channel, we have a reservoir with a water depth H0 equal to 21.4 meter and an underflow gate inducing a water depth HV of 1 meter. At the downstream end of the channel, we have a reservoir with a water depth HDS of 3.6 meter. The first step of the procedure is to calculate the discharge. This is done by applying Torricelli's formula recalled here where C is a discharge coefficient, so this C here, um, that accounts for the local contraction of the flow below the gate. For a well-designed gate, C can be considered equal to 1, which will be the case here. So we find a discharge of about 400 cubic meters per second. 
Then, with this discharge, we can calculate HU and HC. And we find that this channel has a mild slope, because HC is below HU. We can now calculate the water profiles. A M3 profile starting at the gate, here, and the M2 profile starting at the downstream end of the channel. The M3 profile is calculated with 10 dH steps between HV and HC, and the M2 profile is calculated with 10 delta H steps between the downstream depth HDS and HU. The results are indicated in these two tables. Then, to find the position of the hydraulic jump, we calculate the sequent profile M3 prime, in which each water depth corresponds to the sequent depth of the point of the M3 profile. So, you, these are always sequent depths. The values are indicated in the table. Finally, we find the position of the hydraulic jump as the intersection between the M3 prime and the M2 profile, so point Y illustrated here. The exact value of the position of the hydraulic jump is obtained by calculating the intersection between the two curves, the blue one that is the M2 profile and the green one that is the M3 prime profile. We see where the intersection is between the known points that are highlighted. So we just interpolate linearly the profiles between these two points. And we interpolate them as straight lines and we can calculate the intersection. With this, we find the position of the hydraulic jump and we have completed the calculation of the, the flow profile with the position of the hydraulic jump. So, in this lesson, we have seen how to calculate a hydraulic jump and how to find its position in the flow. But when introducing hydraulic jumps, we have also mentioned that hydraulic jumps can generate significant head losses. This will be the topic of the next lesson. Goodbye!